Now at 10, this is Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. And we begin tonight with a state bill written to protect health care workers that may have uh, had some unintended consequences. Thanks for joining us for the Fox 61 News at 10. I'm Brent Harden. And I'm Sarah Sanchez. You may remember the news story from October. 63-year-old Joyce Grayson was found dead in a basement of a halfway house in Willimantic. Now, Joyce was a visiting nurse providing care for registered sex offender Michael Reese. Police say they found Joyce's belongings on Reese, but to this day, he has not been charged in her murder despite being the only suspect. After her death, a bill named in her honor was fast-tracked by state lawmakers. It's been written to ensure safety for home health care workers. But now that very bill is causing concern as workers in at-home hospice care say it would make it impossible for them to do their jobs. Fox 61's Jake Garcia joins us live from the state capitol in Hartford now with their concerns and how state lawmakers are responding. Jake? Well, Brent and Sarah, state lawmakers are actually making some changes to that bill that would require some safety precautions for at-home health care workers after Connecticut Hospice says some of those safety precautions would mean people going without end-of-life care at home. Senate Bill 1. This bill is uh, focusing on making sure that home health workers, when they are going to go and take care of somebody in their homes, they're going to be safe would require medical professionals to conduct a risk and safety assessment under Connecticut law as the hospice industry grows. And then that's the fastest growing segment of people because we want people to age at home. We want people to be able to get treatment at home. State Senator Saud Anwar says safety for these employees are paramount. Or when a person even enters the home, they have enough information to be able to make sure that they need uh, uh, any other safety communications. And they also want to make sure that uh, they're not alone if there's a high risk situation. But in order to get that data, it takes a little bit of time and it takes a little bit of effort. But if passed, workers say it would change at home hospice across the state. Asked us to do background checks on both patients and their families, including criminal records, possession of firearms, drug and substance abuse, um, and all kinds of things, including the statistics of crime in their neighborhood that would have been an insurmountable barrier for people to get hospice care. Which Pierce says would lead to discrimination in hospice care and take too much time when patients need care quickly. Since the end of 2020, we'd had 300 people die within three days, 200 people within two days, and 100 people within one day of entering home hospice care, meaning that few, if any, of those patients would be able to be served. After raising her concerns to the legislature, state lawmakers are now making some changes, and she feels her concerns were heard. Um, we feel that we've been listened to and we've been heard and that they are working um, to craft a bill that won't put them in the position, frankly, of telling a constituent, your loved one died without hospice care because we passed Senate Bill 1. Now, state lawmakers are racing against the clock. This is a short legislative session as it's scheduled to end in just about three weeks. So lawmakers moving at a fast pace to get things passed before the end of session. Reporting live at the state capitol, Jake Garcia, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. All right, Jake, thank you. We are following breaking news in East Hartford now, where I-84 eastbound is backed up after a pedestrian was hit by a car. That crash happened around 8.30 this evening between exits 58 and 59. There's no word yet on the condition of the person hit or why they were walking on the highway. Traffic is closed and emergency crews are on the scene. We'll update you as we learn more. All right, time now for a first check on the forecast. Another warm and sunny day, but we know that can't last. It's <laughs> Connecticut, after all. Hey, yeah, we've had so much rain. Uh, tomorrow's looking much more mild, though, and, and cloudy. Chief Meteorologist Rachel Frank joining us now. Rachel, when's the rain moving in? I think tomorrow evening. So as we're heading closer to sunset, we'll say 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock or so. But we'll start the day off with sun and we'll finish with showers. So at least there will be a little bit more time with those bright conditions. Today's high up around 70 degrees for many areas across the state. What a treat to do this 
two days in a row. But as we mentioned, all good things must come to an end. Temperatures in the mid 50s to right around 60 degrees and the radar is quiet here close to home. But as we widen things out, you'll see these showers that are going to be heading this way as we head into tomorrow evening. Overnight lows dipping back into the 40s as we head towards daybreak. We are waking up to that beautiful sunshine that we've become accustomed to. But watch as we see increasing clouds through the midday and afternoon. Highs inland will be in the 60s, but at the shoreline, upper 50s for high temperatures. So it will be considerably cooler at the beaches. And then we'll see a rising chance for those showers developing as we head into tomorrow evening. And those showers are going to take us right through the day on Thursday. No heavy rain and wind, but it's going to feel awfully chilly. We'll explain your full forecast coming up. All right, Rachel, thank you. Traffic is flowing again on Broad Street hours after a violent road rage incident in Bristol this morning. A man was sent to the hospital with serious injuries sometime around 6 a.m. Fox 61's Matt Karen has more from Bristol police on what they believe happened. The operators became involved in a confrontation. During that confrontation, um, shots were fired by one of the individuals striking the other. An early morning road rage incident ended in shots fired. Two men, two vehicles, two out of state license plates. But at this point, we believe that they're both Connecticut residents. Police wouldn't say who was involved, but one of the vehicles, this 2011 Ford F-150 with New Hampshire plates was a New York State certified escort vehicle. According to the New York DMV, these vehicles are specially licensed to escort bulky, oversized cargo loads on New York highways. The other vehicle, this 2014 Subaru Forester with South Carolina plates. Why would you be in that type of uh, mental discourse? There's no need for it. It's unnecessary, and someone got brought by LifeStar to a hospital. That's it's terrible. That wounded man still fighting for his life. We know it's serious. Uh, he was transported to a, uh, a trauma center, um, and it was certainly more than one gunshot. We're told the two men did not know each other. Despite the confrontation, no one was arrested, not even the shooter. The individual stayed on scene, called 911, and is cooperative. Residents told Fox 61 Broad Street is notorious for speeding drivers. It's very busy, especially when people are coming off the highway down 72 and 84. They, they speed. It's, you know, and it's very scary. Police emphasize that cooler heads prevail on the road. We really want to remind the public to avoid confrontations. If they're uh, the victim or are witnessing aggressive driving or feel like um, there's aggressive driving taking place, they can call the police at any time to report that aggressive driving. And police are also asking any residents who may have witnessed what happened or any business owners who may have video of this incident to contact their headquarters. Reporting in Bristol, Matt Karen, Fox 61, Connecticut's news station. A deadly crash is under investigation in Haddam. Police say a driver was going north on Route 154 early this morning. They were hit head on by another car. One driver was pronounced dead on scene and two others in the other car were taken to the hospital. They're expected to be OK. Anyone who witnessed the crash should call state police. And new at 10 tonight, a middle school teacher in Manchester faces charges now after several students accused him of inappropriate behavior in the classroom. Police say 58-year-old Floyd Gray surrendered to police today. Back in February, Gray had been accused of inappropriately touching students and making inappropriate comments while in class at Illing Middle School. He is charged with breach of peace and risk of injury to a minor. Police in Nagatuck say they've made an arrest in a violent bar fight from last Thursday. Richard Molyneux of Nagatuck attacks accused of stealing another man's gun at Sullivan's Cafe on Church Street, then walking outside the bar and threatening to shoot the man he stole it from. He was detained that day and is facing several charges. A busy night for the Hartford Public Schools Board of Education. While they were hearing public comment on a controversial proposed budget for the next school year, they also heard from a 76-year-old man who says he is still trying to right a wrong 56 years later. Mike Fothergill was expelled from Hartford Public High School in 1968. He says it was for his part in organizing a walkout following the death of Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis one day earlier. Hundreds left the building early, but only a handful of students were expelled. Now Father Gill is calling on the school to give him an honorary diploma. I admit I wasn't a great student, but I wasn't a quitter. There's nothing that was in my mind to do that. 
to take my file and to send it to the Board of Education and to have them expel me from that point without question is something that violated my civil rights. We have a constitutional right to legally redress and peacefully redress our government, which is what happened so many years ago for, um, for my father, Gil. Uh, Father Gill says a similar walkout happened just five years prior, shortly after the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, and he says no arrests were made then. School officials have previously said they need to re uh, review their own records on exactly what happened. Also of note from that same meeting, the Board of Education voted to adopt that $429 million budget proposed for next year. Now that is millions of dollars less than last year's budget, the superintendent saying that's due to the end of pandemic era funding. To compensate for the deficit, Hartford Public Schools is cutting almost 400 positions across the district. They say it's necessary, but say the quality of education will not be impacted.